So shall we get going? Yes, sir. Yeah, first and foremost, today's class, I'll try and keep it short because I, I was feeling very tired uh, having worked on my book and all that kind of thing. I'm spending too much time in front of the computer. I spend about uh, I spend about 12 to 14 hours in front of the computer which isn't good because it's all electromagnetic radiation and I don't know there is this strange thing for a fat old ugly fellow I am, I seem to have some vanity in wearing bifocals. Okay, I don't wear bifocals. Uh, I hate wearing bifocals. I don't know why. Uh, I mean, I'm, I've got so many diseases. And this is something that comes with age naturally. And, but why is it that I don't want to accept that I need to wear bifocals? I don't know. So what happens is that if I wear my glasses, I can't see things because that is distance. Okay, that is, uh, meant for distance so i need to wear either a progressive or a bifocal lens so that uh, i see things which are nearby and read them i was able to read quite okay without uh, glasses so even the ophthalmologist told me carry on but I seem to be developing headaches by sitting in front of the computer. <clears throat> Sorry. And by looking at the screen. But I still don't want to consider wearing bifocals. So. I can understand if somebody is young, good looking, or even why young, even old. Deepankar Gupta, he was an extremely handsome man. <clears throat> in JNU, every girl was madly in love with him. If a man like that, you know, <clears throat> has some vanity, it makes sense. But not a fat pig like me. That doesn't make any sense. Anyway, so let's uh, get on with what we are supposed to do. The thing that we need to do today is this person not the thing the person whom we have to study today is Johann Gott Fried in brackets I'll put this and explain the reason <clears throat> Sorry about that. I don't know what it is with my voice.
Sorry. Now, if any of you is puzzled as to why we are doing, G why we did GM Batista Vico, and why are we doing this man Herder, then there is a reason. The reason is that these two people represent a perspective which is significantly different, which is significantly different from what it is when we studied positivism. Positivism wanted to get rid of uh, both history and uh, both history and uh, philosophy from a possible science that can be created, but. Uh, you see, the positivists failed miserably. They failed miserably. And an alternative perspective about a science and philosophy and history can be found in... Mm, there are many people, but I can't cover all of them. But the two main outstanding figures uh, whose thinking goes entirely contrary to the ideas of positivism, these two people's ideas represent that. So, what we have to remember is that by studying these people, we are first and foremost. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody is impersonating you and asking for money. Yes, I have got that thing. Just ask them to ignore. It is. Uh, it's not ask them to ignore. No, I cannot do anything because. Maya, I cannot do anything. This is a fake profile. Okay, this is a fake profile. Stop your face on it. They can take it off from anywhere, my face. Okay, it's a fake profile. It shows my date of birth Who is 19. Who is that cyber and, uh, crime? Uh, police. I don't know, Maya. Satish, something has to be done, Satish. Nothing. Just people ask, ask people to ignore. Because it's, it's not like my... You can't say ask people to ignore. Then what can I say? Hello. Yes. Uh, okay, okay. So, uh, just put up at this thing saying that this is fake. Hello. Uh, yeah, please put up at this thing that it's fake. Huh? Uh, okay. 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 Yeah, thanks. No. no, 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 don't say that. You tell him I'll report you to the police. I know you're fake. You tell him I know you're fake, I'll report you to the police. You say that only. 
Don't give numbers, nothing, all that. Don't give any information. Just tell them only one thing. If anything happens, I will report you to the police if you keep persisting. So it's okay. No, it's okay. Right. Thanks. Right. Uh, a student of mine. Everybody is seeing it now? Yeah. That fellow is sending it generally. So what you do is, Maya. Maya. Just go on to my Facebook. Maya, I'm in the class, please. <clears throat> See, the problem is that uh, somebody has cloned my account. If he hacked it, then it would have been a different issue. Somebody has cloned my Facebook account. I think I should get rid of it. I don't use it anymore. Uh, he's cloned that account. It, he date of birth says 1998, and um, my wife is going ha ha ha. She's a bit like uh, Yasmin when it comes to this. There'll be a lot of noise. Oh, big, flurried activity. Come on, that's rubbish. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, so. Uh, So, Johann Gottfried Herder and uh, Gian Battista Vico, they represent an alternative view of philosophy, science, and uh, history. So, I hope you remember uh, that confusing, complicated bit where uh, Vico wrote about not the history of philosophy, but the philosophy of history. Uh, and he said it should be narrated as a philosopher and it should be narrated philosophically. That is what Vico had said. So, what you need to understand is that he went back to antiquity. <clears throat> and I told you that he's unfairly called an apologist of uh, antiquity. There's nothing uh, to apologize there. And he was able to give us an alternative construct. It's to, for the benefit of those of you who did not stay on uh, till the end of the class, uh, I had ended by telling you about Descartes and uh, his reductious, reductivist or reductionist epistemology. Uh, which is based in the idea of observation. Uh, whereas uh, what we get, and uh, positivism borrows a lot from uh, the Cartesian idea of reason, thought, proof, verification. So all, even the ideas of what is verification had been changed by Vico. So in his uh, Scienza Nuovo, a new science, he was basically trying 
to make a case for a different kind of a science and he was relying upon the categories that were created in antiquity which is mainly Greece but since he was also into jurisprudence he was also talking about things that were there in the Roman Empire and the Roman period. So that is the thing that uh, you need to remember. So Vico's Nuenza, uh, so sorry, what am I saying? Uh, Sienza Nuovo. Okay, that that is uh, his his most seminal work, a work that defines what he is, who he is, and what comes out of him. All that is something that you find in uh, his work. Uh, Nuenza, so why am I saying Nuenza? Uh, Sienza Nuovo. Okay, and his uh, Viram Factum. Uh, Verum, why am I saying Viram? My wife has completely uh, what should I say? She's kind of distracted me completely. So, uh, verum factum, that is the principle that he brought uh, to the table, so to speak. And therefore, since he's giving you an alternative idea of science, and mind you, this idea of science is not in itself a success. Uh, it is not in itself a success, but yet it is worth studying because that is the foundation for the hermeneutics movement that came a little later or much later. Uh, first and foremost with Wilhelm Dilthey and uh, later on it also came into uh, the 20th century in the form of uh, Hans Gadamer and Paul Ricoeur uh, and you can also include Richard Rorty in that particular tradition uh, and of course you can include that entire since Mr. Akshay Puneet asked me a question uh, about uh, uh, yesterday it also puts into uh, perspective the whole idea of, uh, you know, Foucault and their being influenced by the Heideggerian notion of phenomenology, which has been drawn from uh, Nietzsche, so you have destruct as a category, D-E-S-T-R-U-K-T, -E destruct by Heidegger, you have archaeology of knowledge as a category created by Michel Foucault, who called himself a historian of ideas like Isaiah Berlin also did. And then you have the notion of deconstruction, 
uh, by Derrida and you have the notion of reconstruction by Gadamer. So you'll see all these people are uh, interlinked uh, and uh, I'm not going to go in too deeply into it. I will only teach you what is the thing that you require to understand, uh, which means that uh, when we do hermeneutics, Dilthai has to be done. Gadamer also has to be done, but I'm not going to do Paul Ricoeur. Uh, definitely, I'm not. I don't know if I'm going to go into Maybe I'll just for a comparison with Gadamer, I might do a bit of Derrida. And uh, I might, if there is time and if you people aren't leaving the class, already somebody has left. Uh, if uh, you people are not leaving the class, then I'll do a little bit of the pragmatism. <laughs> Okay, uh, so I will also do uh, the American pragmatism of uh, Richard Rorty and uh, my, I was always impressed with Richard Rorty's uh, phrase objectification of knowledge. It's an amazing phrase loaded with meaning. Okay, he talks about how this whole thing of emphasis on science and all that is leading to objectification of knowledge. Just as you would say, objectification of women in advertisements, okay? So similarly, he says that this is objectified knowledge and therefore it is false. It is all false. So, and uh, I was very impressed with that. And then I read Habermas's, uh, uh, what should I say, obituary of Richard Rorty and uh, Habermas said, if there is one word in this world that Richard Rorty would want, if you can describe in one world, uh, if you can describe in one world, what Richard Rorty wanted to see in this world uh, flourish, the word is love. Okay, so not the amorous kind of love, but love between human beings. So Rorty is a truly great man, truly great man, died too early and uh, very passionate. And it's a funny thing that this, this kind of an obituary should come from Habermas who's carved in ivory. He's not somebody who displays passion. Rorty did that. Anyway, <clears throat> so if Batista, GM Batista, what am I saying? GM Batista, Vico, is somebody who represents one facet of an alternative, yet another facet of an alternative uh, to the positivist way of thinking can be found in Johann Gottfried Herder. Now, if you're wondering why I have put that fawn in German, the V is uh, pronounced 
fa. So why did I put that in bracket? Because it was in, I think in the year 1802 that uh, he was conferred. It's a title, by the way. Okay, it's uh, not a part of a name. It is a title that has been conferred upon a lot of people. It's like royalty. So the German equivalent of English royalty. So when somebody has that fawn uh, attached to their name, that means that they have been conferred that particular title. Uh, but Herder himself never used that title. And another person like him is uh, Otto Gierke, uh, about whom I'll talk when we come to the medie medieval period. He was also conferred this fawn, but he refused to use it. He said, no, I don't want to use this. So Gottfried Herder, but if you want to use Fawn, please feel free to use. Okay, so what uh, you will see is there are three things with which Herder is uh, uh, there are three things that you see here and uh, so my wife is talking so loudly Maya can you please close the door Maya, I give up. I've, why is she doing outside this room with the door open? I don't He's associated with three things, the first of which is the German Enlightenment. This is the first of the things that he's associated with, I told you that uh, broadly speaking, there are three enlightenments in uh, the, uh, they are, there are three things that are there in, uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, in uh, enlightenment, the first is the Renaissance, the second is the French Enlightenment and the third is the German Enlightenment and I told you that both the pessimistic as uh, I mean sorry both French and German Enlightenments have a tendency to be a little pes pessimistic actually German Enlightenment is quite pessimistic about the possibilities of Western knowledge so you'll see people like Arthur Schopenhauer, I have talked to you about them. And I told you that they turned to India and they turned to look for knowledge from India. Uh, Schopenhauer even learned Sanskrit. Now another person who was equally influenced by India and I'll get to that point and how he was influenced is Herder. Herder had, uh, <clears throat> if uh, Vico was all about the, uh, 
just a minute, please. I'll just close the door and come. So another person, if, if uh, Vico is influenced by the antiquity of the West, which is Greece and Rome, Herder is uh, somebody who was influenced by the antiquity of the East, which is India. And uh, we'll get to that story in a moment. So this is one of the first things that uh, Herder is associated with. The second thing which is associated with is a movement, if uh, you can call it that. Okay, if you can call it that. It is uh, called, what happened? Stormund drunk. There is a little bit of a problem with this. There is a little bit of a problem with this. And what is the problem? The problem is regarding translations. Translation of what or how you will translate that into English. There are two schools of thought. There are two schools of thought which use two different translations. And unfortunately for us, we'll have to choose one of them because you can't have both of them. So let's see. But I'll come to that in a bit. And the third one is what is called Weimar Classic. And uh, <clears throat> the Weimar classic movement lasted for 30 years. And this is a very significant thing because after the Weimar classic movement came to an end or found few takers, then you find people like Friedrich Nietzsche, who essentially were in Weimar and brought in a different kind of perspective, a different kind of Nietzsche is somebody who did things which is which are completely unexpected. Okay. If you are expecting a punch in your stomach and you brace yourself for that, Nietzsche punches you in the face. You are not braced for that. So imagine how that impact will be. You know a punch is coming and you think it's going to be 
directed in at your abdomen but he uses it to punch your face so the kind of change one second please So Nietzsche is somebody who really shocks you, literally shocks you. Anyway, so now let's pick off each of these. German Enlightenment. Okay, I told you it is pessimistic. It is dark. And I also told you that it is something that uh, reflects itself in art and architecture. As dark buildings and black color. Okay, so even today, if you listen to Gothic rock, you have these bands who wear black clothes, completely black clothes. They have coal around their eyes. They have coal around their eyes and all these things are still there. So when you use the term Gothic, then it has a negative uh, connotation attached to it. This also had an impact on philosophy, unlike the French Revolution, which didn't have much of an impact on uh, literature and philosophy, uh, the German Enlightenment had a huge impact on philosophy and literature. Okay, so since it also had an impact on philosophy and literature, you can consider Herder to be a product of the earlier part of the German Enlightenment. Okay, he was there in it with uh, various people like uh, Schelling, Friedrich Schelling uh, and uh, Johann Guta. He was there with all those people in the early part. The later people are people like Arthur Schopenhauer, Holderlin. So Yes. Uh, has this German a pessimistic no, sir? How ah. can we say it is enlightenment, sir? How it is enlightenment? It is, if, please, first and foremost, you have to understand it as philosophical pessimism. 
The philosophical pessimism is that the Renaissance generated a certain form of humanism which celebrated the unlimited potential of the human being to achieve things, achieve many, many different kinds of things. Okay, and that kind, and it, it also celebrated the human ability and thought that the world will get better and better and that, you know, it'll be completely rationalist and once it becomes rationalist, then the human being conquers everything on the way. That is the original Renaissance. But by the time you come to the French Renaissance, you realize that there is a problem in society which has been put wonderfully by Rousseau of the paradox of poverty amidst plenty. And he also saw the limits of rationality that Again, the positivists had this idea of the linear growth of rationality, which is with every passing day, we become more and more rational. And because we become more and more rational, it basically means that the past will always be worse than the present. The present will always be worse than the future. And we will just go on improving in a linear fashion. In a linear, as a line, you can draw a line infinitely, right? There's no way you can say I can stop a line here. So they believed in this great thing about rationality, modern rationality. And uh, Vico also, his constructivist epistemology is an alternative to the modern rationality of René Descartes, which he believed was reductionism and through reductionism he thought that rationality did not achieve anything other than destroying knowledge. <clears throat> so he called it destructive epistemology. That is what Vico called uh, René Descartes' uh, conception of rationality and knowledge, reductionist and therefore destructionist epistemology and offered an alternative in the form of constructivist epistemology. I don't want to go into that again now. So the pessimism is philosophical, understanding that there are limits when I talk to you about romanticism and expressivism, there are two things that you need to know. I'll talk about romanticism when we talk about Rousseau. Uh, and I'll talk about expressivism when I talk about Hegel. Uh, because actually, if you look at Herder, Herder is also a part of the movement of expressivism. Expressivism is people expressing themselves. The encouragement to not just one form of expression of ideas, but as Charles Taylor 
very rightly puts it, the encouragement of numerous ways of expressing ideas, probably about the same thing, or of about different things. So that is something that you'll find in Herder. Herder can be called an expressivist. And I'll justify that statement in a bit. Okay, so the pessimism is not like it isn't it isn't like uh, pessimism as ah, we can't do anything. It is enlightenment because you understand that there are limits to what the human being can achieve. The whole French romanticism, which is expressed through the medium of art, painting mainly, is something that tries to construct an alternative aesthetic. It tries to construct the helplessness of man in the face of the fury of nature. We are going to have the storm. It is supposed to fall landfall what is that yes the landfall was supposed to happen even before the cyclone itself came the tornado that came along with that killed enough people in bengal so it is not as if it is not as if uh, we are invincible which is the picture that the original enlightenment, the Renaissance paints. That's the picture that it paints. And it is adopt, ad, ad, adopted wholly by this island nation called England. And that's where all the results of that enlightenment came out first and foremost. But the negative reactions to what happened there in England came from people in the French Enlightenment and in the German Enlightenment. The German Enlightenment wanted to prove that you are not in control. But after Weimar classic, or in English it's Weimar classicism, after that is over, yet again you find a new form of humanism in nature that I'll talk about a little later, not now. Now, when you're talking about Sturm und Drang, Sturm und Drang has this horrible problem of translation. Even for those who are well versed in German. The literal translation This is the literal translation, okay? The age of Sturm und Drang was one of storm. To that point, it's fine. Storm as in thoughts. Drive is where the problem comes. How do you interpret drive? Some people say that you should translate it literally. Okay, even Germans, some people say that you should translate it literally. First, there is a storm and 
then you realize that there is a storm and because of the storm you want to get out of this and that is the drive finding a solution drive is not driving actually but being driven you say i am driven to find a solution to the problem so that is how they want you to interpret uh drive the other translation is storm and stress now while this first kind of translation is a literal translation this is metaphorical it's a metaphorical translation the storm that is there in the minds of people about what constitutes knowledge about why people should do something and should not do something all that they believe that whole storm intellectual storm that had gathered was something that was leading to stress among people people were stressed out just imagine if you are constantly thinking about a problem if you are presented with problems and asked to find or you ask yourself that i or you tell yourself i'm sorry uh, you tell yourself that i need to find a solution to this then that puts you under stress so again some of the germans themselves will tell you that please translate that into drang not into drive literally but metaphorically translate that into stress now here is where the optimistic and pessimistic as we use in an everyday uh, language they come into being okay in everyday language not a philosophical pessimism everyday language now those who support the storm and drive translation they say that if you say stress when you are not optimistic about finding a solution to the turbulence that is there in your mind you are nowhere near finding a solution to the turbulence which is the storm which is in your mind if you say that it is stress because we like to avoid stress we don't pick up stress all right so they say fine it might be a metaphor but if you translate that way you are doing a great deal of injustice to the original expression to the original expression because the original expression they say is asking you to find a solution not get bogged down by pressure or stress it's asking you to find a solution and therefore you should use the term drive and not stress charles taylor is one who believes in this tr- translation okay charles taylor is uh, an amazing authority on 
all things German starting from Enlightenment to Hegel. From Enlightenment to Hegel, the German Enlightenment to Hegel, he's a proper authority. That's what he talks about. I told you, I'll come back to the idea of expressivism. It is here that he's talking about expressivism. In fact, the Sturm und Drang period, the two most important figures here are Wolfgang Goethe, the poet, German poet, and the other is Herder. Okay, most people, most definitely Charles Taylor, associates these two people as the main figures of the Sturm und Drang uh, period that existed. And the exploration of their writings, the exploration of their writings does not show them throwing the towel. It doesn't show they're throwing the towel. It is something that shows multiple expressions, not from multiple thinkers, just from Wolfgang Goethe and Johann Herder, you will find there are multiple expressions of solutions. Okay, so that is what is expressivism. So, this expressivism that begins during the storm and it's actually supposed to be pronounced Sturm and Drang. So that which began with he doesn't because he's he's not a literary critic, so he doesn't emphasize too much. He meaning Charles Taylor, he doesn't emphasize too much on Guter. Uh, he emphasizes on Herder. And he believes that the expressivism that started with Herder actually culminated in the thought of uh, Hegel. He believes that it culminated in the thought of Hegel, which is by no way pessimism. It is optimism. Though the German Enlightenment began as pessimism, you get an alternative model of modern rationality with Hegel. It is an alternative model because it's a teleological model. It's a teleological model. We'll discuss telos and teleological when we do Aristotle. Hold your horses till then. So it is an alternative conception of rationality. So much so that Hegel even uses an expression which he calls the cunning of reason. He says our own reason can play cunning games with us, lead us to believe things that are not the way they are. So you see, he has a different conception of rationality. But he's the same person who goes on to say, the real is the rational and the rational is the real. Right? 
So that is how he constructs his dialectic. I've had occasions where I told you, don't go by the Johann Fichte thing of thesis, antithesis, synthesis. No, Hegel doesn't use that. Neither does Marx. Okay, Hegel is somebody who believes that a dialectic is something which is in the nature of a series of negations, negations of doubt, until you reach a confirmation. The confirmation need not be positive. It can be a negative confirmation. But you have to reach that confirmation, which is certainty. So he says that it begins with Herder, expressivism. I'll get on to a little bit more uh, about uh, Herder's expressivism in a minute. Now, Weimar classic, or in English, it is Weimar classicism. It's classicism because Weimar classicism goes back to ancient roots again. And to that extent, despite the fact that Nietzsche is not really a part of the Weimar classicism, he is definitely the person who again goes back. There are two important events in Nietzsche's life as far as he's concerned. One is the French Revolution and the other is ancient Greece and the thought that was generated in ancient Greece. These are the two main factors identified by Nietzsche to construct a society differently. But Weimar classicism, Weimar was a place in the Prussian Empire. Okay, and Nietzsche, by the way, died there at the turn of the previous century. In the year 1900, he died in Weimar. He lived most of his time there. Uh, and this Weimar classicism is a return to classical roots classical knowledge, a return to that, to those roots. That's what it is. So who are the people who are associated with this? Well, it's Herder again. Guter again and of these three people, Goethe and Friedrich Schiller are literary giants of Weimar classicism. In fact, you must understand Weimar classicism itself as being a result of the Sturm und Drang thing that happened. It's a response to that. So that is how you have to see this. Okay. <clears throat> But Weimar classicism, with the exception of Herder, is generally considered to be a literary movement. Okay. 
Oh no, I can't do that. Can I do this? Yes. It's not very philosophical. Herder is the only philosopher there, perhaps. Okay, but in Sturm and Drang, there is a lot of philosophy. Okay, now there are different phases in Herder's life. The first phase is where he is rationally exploring. Okay. He is rationally exploring for answers. He has, and in this phase, he does not have any affiliations or allegiances to any one form of thought. This is the first phase. The second phase, you see that he's a changed man. In the second phase, he becomes a clergyman. After coming into the influence of Johann Georg Hammam. No, I always forget the spelling. I think it is hum, hum. Yeah, that is a spelling. Who was from a place called There should actually be two dots on the O. Kunigsberg is how you will be pronouncing it. Now, where do I put it? Yeah, I'll put it here. Hamam did not believe in secularism or in any form of non-religious rationality. So, while being under the 
influence of uh, Johann Georg, that will be John George Hammam. Okay. Johann Georg is, Johann is John in English and uh, Georg is uh, uh, George. So Haman, Hamam did not believe in secularism. He didn't because please remember their secularism, not our secularism, where we give equal recognition to all religions, not that. His idea of secularism, their European and later American ideas of secularism are non-religious ideas. He believed that they did not have secularism and rationality based in secularism did not have the ability to cohesively bind and hold ideas together to make them a cogent whole. This is again where there is a certain sense of expressivism in Herder, when he went through this, he started believing that there can be one expression of the multiplicity of ideas that you see. You don't really have to have different expressions, different explanations for different things that you see. He started believing that religious thinking had that potential to create a binding and a communitarian expression of ideas which are universal. They are universal. And so he moved on to this particular form. And for many years, he spoke and acted like a clergyman. And therefore, you find that at this point, he's a religious personality. He's a religious personality. I think I'll stop here today with your permission. My headache has become worse. Is that okay with you? Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. I would like to have finished uh, Herder today, but I don't think I can. Okay, sir. Yeah. So, please excuse me for today. And uh, sorry for all those interruptions. My wife gets all head up very, very quickly. She gets set up. She needn't. These are small things. Cyber crime is a regular thing. There's a photograph of somebody lying in bed that doesn't even look like me. If you see a whale, you know, one of those big whales, the humpback whale, or if you see an elephant, or if you see a rhinoceros, that kind of figure lying in bed, then it is me, can be me. But that fellow there is not at all like me. And people know my face. His face is clearly visible. 
anyway so the, sorry about those interruptions and sorry about the way the class went today i think it went very badly no oh, sir D did i make sense to you yes sir yes sir okay thank you very much i was very distracted one and the headache okay so we'll resume this tomorrow finish this off i wanted to start the hermeneutic thing tomorrow itself but we'll do it day after tomorrow not a problem okay thank you thank you for thank you sir take care yeah thank, thank you, you. Sir. yeah thank you for putting up with me and uh, see you tomorrow yes yeah. yes sir bye So Prashant, how is your father? Good, sir. Okay. Hmm? Has Fine, he gone, sir. Now. Has he gone to the doctor? No, sir. No, but make sure that... Uh, oh, I should stop recording. One sec.